What's the main difference between Calvinist and non-Calvinist? Dr. R.C. Sproul answers that question, and we engage. Let's dive in. Welcome back to Sociology 101. I'm often asked a question by those who really don't want to take a lot of time on this particular issue between Calvinist and non-Calvinist. They just what, break it down for me. What, what is the basic difference between the two? Well, R.C. Sproul was asked that same question, and he gives an answer that I want us to go over from our perspective. Um, our perspective, you say, what are you? Are you an Arminian? I, I don't like to be called that because I differ with Arminianism on some key points. Uh, we've called ourselves traditionalists uh, or provisionists because we believe in God's provision of all people. Uh, he's provided salvation and a means of atonement for every single man, woman, boy, and girl, and therefore anyone can be saved. And the only reason someone is not saved is because they refuse the provision of God. Uh, that he makes himself abundantly clear, and therefore all are without excuse. Uh, no one can say, I was unloved by my maker, I was not given faith, or I was not given uh, revelation or light, or uh, and, and I was made this way, or I was created for damnation. Nobody can say any of those kinds of things because God has provided for all people. And R.C. gives, uh, R.C.'s gone on to be with the Lord. I used to listen to his tapes back when I was a Calvinist from Lincoln Ministries. I got the little cassette tapes in the mail, and uh, I learned a lot from R.C. I have a lot of respect for him and his ministry, even though obviously I disagree with him theologically. Logically, but I want you to hear his answer to this question. What is the main difference between Calvinist and what he refers to as semi-Pelagians in this? Uh, I think it's a little bit of poisoning the well, a little bit of uh, a boogeyman uh, uh, tactic there to, to try to paint us as the, the heretic. But um, nevertheless, let's overlook the labeling issue and really look at the main point of contention, spe- specifically really with regard to philosophy, uh, the, the understanding of free will and what he sees as the major distinction between Calvinist and non-Calvinist. I was interviewed yesterday for a series of programs that were being presented about Reformed theology, and the person who was uh, running this uh, program asked me what the basic issue was between Augustinian theology or Reformed theology and historic semi-Pelagianism. I said, I think it comes down to a different understanding of freedom I th- and of free will. I think the principal problem that people have with divine sovereignty, with divine election, is immediately they say, well, we believe that man has free will. Well, I don't know any Augustinian in all of church history who didn't strongly affirm that we have free will. We are volitional creatures. Okay, so I, I want to just stop there and correct a little bit of the historical aspects of this because um, St. Augustine was not a comp- was not a compatibilist, um, at least not in his writings. Now, maybe you could say he would have become a compatibilist at some point, um, but when he early, in his early writings on free will, he speaks of free will in the same way that we do in a libertarian sense, just like all the early church fathers before him did. And so this, this concept of defining free will uh, in a compatibilistic sense, i.e. people are doing what they want to do, um, but their wants are ultimately controlled or determined by uh, the creator God, um, that is not uh, what Augustine meant by free will when he spoke of free will. Um, it's not what most theologians throughout history mean when they talk about free will. It's certainly not what the average uh, Christian thinks of when they re- re- you know, talk about free will. Um, free will is understood as more of a libertarian type of freedom. And the reason we even have that vernacular or that adjective of free will and libertarian free will is because it needs to be distinguished between what some are calling now compatibilistic free will. And um, as we've described before, libertarian free will is the the categorical ability of the will to refrain or not refrain from a given moral action. It's a self-determined will. In other words, it's not controlled by someone or some uh, thing other than itself. Um, In other words, God does not determine which choices you'll make, but that you'll be free to make them, and that God has decreed for us to have that freedom. In other words, it's God's sovereign right as a ruler to rule how he wants to, and if he wants to grant creatures a libertarian freedom of the will, then by golly, he can, and uh, it's his his prerogative to do so. Um, And so... When, when people talk about free will, there's sometimes a redefinition of the term that has historically been understood as the self-determined will of a creature. It's not controlled by or determined by God through uh, causal means, whatever those could be described as, but instead it is, it is determined within and by oneself. It's not being controlled out, uh, externally 
by someone other than the agent themselves. That's what's meant typically by this concept of a moral free will historically, even back in uh, Augustine's earliest writings. Uh, just to clarify that point, because what he's going to go on to describe here is what he believes free will is, and he's going to describe it as compatibilism. God has given us minds and hearts, and He's given us wills. And we exercise that will all the time. We make choices every minute of the day. And we choose what we want. We choose... And who, do, and who, do, who controls our wants? Well, our wants are controlled by the circumstances and by our nature, okay? Both of which are meticulously under God's sovereign plan and decree. And therefore, to say that we are choosing according to what we want doesn't mean much when what we want is determined by someone other than ourselves. And so when we say we determine to act in accordance with our desires, we can choose which desire we're going to act to fulfill. So if I have the desire to eat cake, I can choose to eat cake based upon that desire. If I have a desire to lose weight, I can make a choice based upon that desire to lose weight. Um, it is my choice as the moral agent to choose which of the desires I'm going to seek to fulfill. And if you make that desire itself determinative, then you're ultimately taking the responsibility away from the agent who's choosing to act on his given desires. Now, what Calvinists like Sproul will often argue is that whichever those desires you act upon, that was the greatest one. And therefore, the desire itself becomes determinative, like an instinctive being we are just acting according to the greatest preset desire that was created in us by God in the given circumstances. And therefore, we're not really not making a free choice. We're making an instinctive reflex uh, based upon how God has made us in a given set of stimuli. And we don't believe that falls under moral freedom. We don't, under, we don't, we don't believe that that's the way it works. Um, but that's what he's ultimately arguing for here as he explains what free will is from his perspective. Freely. Nobody's coercing us, putting a gun to our head, and we're not robots. Robots don't have minds. Robots don't have wills. Robots don't have hearts. We're human beings. We make choices. That's why we're in trouble with God, because the choices that we make in our fallen condition are sinful choices. We choose according to our desires, which are only wicked continuously, the Bible tells us. And that we are, as it were, dead in sin and trespasses, even though biologically we're very much alive. And we're walking according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, fulfilling uh, the lusts of the flesh is what the Bible tells us. Right. And the lust of the flesh, according to 1 John 2.16, is not from the Father, but from the world. In other words, it's not because God decreed you to have the lust of the flesh or the lust of the eyes or the pride of life. Those things are not from the Father, based upon what the inspired word says. And therefore, to say that God decrees all things would, would also be to say God decrees the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And yet the Bible specifically says these things are not from the Father. So you have the Calvinist saying God decrees all things, which would include, obviously, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. But yet the Bible says these things are not from God. Uh, you got James saying God doesn't even tempt men to evil. He can't do evil, doesn't even tempt men. And yet you got uh, Calvinists saying God decrees not only the temptation, but your choice, your desire, and your, uh, you know, your, your sin. And that is the problem here, is that Calvinists use the same vocabulary oftentimes, sounds really good, but they're using a very different dictionary. And so he says, yeah, men make choices all the time. Well, what's a choice? It's a selection between available options. Well, under determinism, i.e. compatibilism, you are not making a choice. You are instinctively, reflexively acting in accordance with the greatest desire that God has determined for you to have in the circumstances that he has likewise determined. So you're not making really a choice, a selection between available options, because there is no available option to you. The only option is to do what God has decreed, decided for you to do. And that is where compatibilism philosophically falls apart. And so the Bible makes it very clear that we are actively involved in making choices for which we are responsible and which expose us to the judgment of God. And yet at the same time, the Bible teaches us that we're enslaved. We're free from coercion, 
But we don't have what Augustine called royal liberty. We are not free from ourselves. We're not free from our own sinful inclinations and our sinful appetites and our sinful desires. We're slaves to our sinful impulses. That's what the Bible teaches us again and again and again. The humanist doctrine of free will, the pagan view of free will, says that man is free not only from coercion, but man is free in the sense that his will is indifferent. It has no predisposition or inclination, bias, or bent towards sin. Okay, and I think he would probably, if pressed, put Arminians and provisionists in with that quote-unquote pagan definition. But as often the case that we'll see with Calvinists, and sometimes we do this on our side too, I'm not trying to blame just Calvinists for doing this, everybody does this in a debate. It's a fallacy. It's a false dilemma. It, it paints two extreme versions as these are your only two options. Either it's compatibilistic determinism, i.e. Calvinism, or it's this pagan thing that we're just indifferent and there is no, there is no inclination towards sin or all those kinds of things. You're, it's either one of those two options. Just like uh, sometimes uh, you'll hear Calvinists talk about it's either determinism or it's God shocked off of his throne. He's just, he's just baffled by what's happening. And he just, oh my gosh, this is just, this is just crazy. I don't know what to do. And he's wringing his hands. And sometimes Calvinists will paint that dichotomy as your only two options. Well, that's kind of what he's doing here. It's either free will, um, meaning compatibilistic, deterministic free will, God, i.e. determines your nature, your desires from birth so that they only, you can only hate God from birth unless he irresistibly changes your nature to make you love him. Um, and and that, either that's the case or it's this pagan uh, philosophy of, you know, um, that you're just indifferent um, and there's no reasons that you make choices and there's just randomness and all these other things and that's the only other option out there. Philosophically, that's just false. There, there, that, that, aren't, that is not the only options philosophically that people have come up with to answer these difficult issues. And so he's not really educating his crowd here. He's actually indoctrinating his crowd because he's not giving them all of the best robust answers to this philosophical issue of free will. Now, if he presented the best of the best from the best philosophers from the other side, and then he said, here's why I believe in compatibilism, then this would be a good, uh, this would be a good clash to take. It would be a good thing for you to hear because he would be educating you on the options. But unfortunately, R.C. here in this in this particular class isn't doing a very good job of educating his audience. He's just indoctrinating them based upon a false dilemma. And that's unfortunate because I think we need to do better at going a little deeper into seeing which of the which of these two perspectives is most likely. And what you'll notice here, I want you to listen for this. What you'll notice here is that ultimately he's presuming that if someone is enslaved in bondage, um, in this condition of, of being depraved, that they can't confess that fact even, okay? There's, that's the presumption of Calvinism. And this is one of the reasons that I played this and entitled it as, what is the main difference between the two? This is the main difference between the two in the sense that Calvinists have, have adopted this worldview that if people are enslaved or in bondage to sin, therefore they're incapable of confessing that truth in faith unless God irresistibly changes their nature and causes them to want to do that. Um, and I don't find that anywhere established within the scriptures. There's nothing within scriptures that even suggests that mankind, because of their bondage, is morally incapable of confessing their bondage. Because they're not free, they're enslaved, therefore they can't confess that they're enslaved. Uh, they're, they're born in chains, but they therefore cannot confess that they have chains on even when revealed to by God himself, and even when God himself makes an appeal to be freed from those chains. What you'll hear here as he ends, in just a couple more, about 30 more seconds here, what you'll hear him say, listen for it, is he'll ultimately assume, without argumentation, without biblical merit, he will assume that you must be set free in order to confess that you're not free. Let me say that again, and listen for it yourself. You must, here's the presumption of a Calvinist, you must be set free in order to confess that you aren't free. Okay, so you have to be somehow set free, and then you can confess, I'm enslaved. But really, you're not enslaved anymore because now you've been set free. So what you'd have to actually confess is, I used to be enslaved, but now I'm set free. This is the fallacy of Calvinism. It's, it's like what we talked about before with the alcoholic. An alcoholic's first step is to admit that he has a problem. 
hi, my name is so-and-so, and and I am an alcoholic. That's the very first step. Why? Because you have to own your sin. You have to own your, your fault. Now, somebody can say, I'm an alcoholic, without checking themselves in their rehab facility to get free. Somebody can confess that, okay? And they're still enslaved. They're still addicted. Just your, your confession of the fact that you're uh, a sinner does not free you from sin. Confession of the fact that you're in bondage, that you have chains, does not free you from that bondage, but is the first step that is necessary in order for you to find freedom. And anyone and everyone who is in bondage to sin and under the, the, the wrath of God can confess that fact when confronted by the inspired truth of God's word. And here's where the Calvinists makes their mistake. They presume that you must be set free in order to confess that you're in bondage in order to to ultimately say, we aren't free, I have to be set free first. And that's that's the, the cart before the horse and the dilemma that the Calvinist creates in this concept. Listen to what he says. Because the pagan and the humanist deny the radical character of the fall. But the Bible teaches us that we are fallen creatures who still choose and make decisions, but we make them in the context of our prison of sin. And the only way we can get out of that prison is if God sets us free. Do you hear that? Only way you can get out of that prison in other words, the only way you can choose God, the only way you can uh, come to God, the only way you can admit that you're in bondage, the only way that you can confess your sinfulness and trust in, the Christ, and trust in Christ is this, if he set you free first. So he has to set you free in order for you to confess that you're enslaved. But once you've been set free, you're no longer enslaved. So you're actually not confessing that you're enslaved right now. You're confessing that you were enslaved before he did this miraculous supernatural inner work of regeneration on you first. The Calvinists simply get the cart before the horse. Yes, we can. So the the false dichotomy that I I said earlier, it's either this pagan, you know, uh, view of free will where we're indifferent. We don't have, we don't have the problem of sin at all. We're just indifferent. We're all perfect beings. And that's the paganist, you know, Pelagian view, boogeyman, or compatibilistic determinism. It's just really the only two options. No, those are not the only two options. There's another option. Here's the other option. You are a sinner. You are broken, but guess what? Though broken people cannot fix themselves, broken people can confess their brokenness in the light of God's word. Matter of fact, I I wrote this on a Facebook page just recently. Look at what it says. It's impossible for a broken self to fix itself, but it is possible for a broken self to humbly confess its brokenness and accept help when it's offered. Let me say that again. It's impossible for a broken self to fix itself. There's total inability right there. If you want total inability, that's it. If you're broken, you cannot fix your brokenness. If you're unsaved, you cannot save yourself. If you're in bondage, you cannot free yourself. But it is possible for an enslaved, broken self to humbly confess his brokenness and his enslavement and admit, I can't save myself. I cannot get rid of these chains on my own. I cannot overcome this alcohol addiction by myself. I cannot do this alone. I need someone's help. And the only one who can help me, according to the scripture, is Jesus. Listen, do not adopt any worldview that removes the responsibility of each individual to humble himself and own his own mistakes. Because if that's consistently, if that worldview is consistently lived out, it will create a passive victimhood mentality that can never find true freedom from addiction and the bondage of sin. You must, as the scripture says, over and over and over and over again, humble yourself. And whenever it says humble yourself, it's not being Pelagian. It's saying that you're responsible to humble yourself because you are. Every single one of us are. And if you humble yourself, you bring your brokenness into the light, then God promises, because he's gracious, to set you free through the blood of Jesus Christ. Those who humble themselves will be made free. Those who are broken will be made whole if and only if they humbly confess their brokenness. That's the word of the Lord. That is the good news. The good news is that God fix, fixes broken vessels. What is your responsibility in that? To confess your brokenness. To come out of your pigsty and your humiliation and say, I can't do this on my own. I, I have to have the help of the Father. I cannot do this. That's your responsibility. 
If you're waiting on God to do something irresistibly to make you overcome your addiction, oh God, if you'll just take away this desire. Oh God, if you'll just remove this addiction. Oh God, if you will just make me want this or want that. Listen, you're going to be waiting until it's too late because the Bible over and over again says that's your responsibility, not his. Help me spread this truth. Go to sociology101.com if you can support us. We need all the patron help that we can get, one-time givers, anyone who can help us spread the word. We uh, need your support. Join our team and be a part of Sociology 101. Thanks for tuning in. God bless. See you next time. Thanks for attending our online university classroom. Remember, this is a listener-supported ministry, so please consider becoming a patron of the podcast by donating online. Join our team and help spread the word. For more resources, books, and articles from Professor Flowers, or to learn how you can support this ministry, please visit www.soteriology101.com.